Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Matteo opened his eyes. It was pitch darkness around him. Darkness unlike any other, even if one were to bury their head under a blanket. He could tell there was no blanket on him. For a minute, he struggled to understand where he was, but he couldn't. In his mind, there were incomprehensible shapes intertwining and forming even more intricate patterns. Unable to determine his location, he focused on himself and suddenly became afraid. It turned out that he couldn't even identify himself. Where he was became a secondary question, it was now more important to figure out who he was. I, thoughts buzzed in his head. I am human. Well, that's clear. I am a man. That doesn't seem to be in doubt either. And if I assume that I must have a name. Yes, my name is Matteo. Of course, Matteo. I'm lying in some tightly enclosed space with not a single ray of light. He tried to raise his hands, but they immediately encountered something cold and metallic. This coldness seemed to bestow sensations upon him, and he felt an icy wave washing over his entire body. Oh my god, am I dead? But if I can feel it, it means I'm still alive. Have I been buried alive? This thought filled him with such horror that he began pounding the walls of the box he seemed to be in for reasons unknown to him. He didn't have to pound for long. Suddenly, something clicked and he could move forward. A bright light flashed and Matteo closed his eyes, expecting something final and dreadful to happen. However, nothing else happened. The light went out. He cautiously opened his eyes. The pitch black darkness was no longer there. In the dim light, he could make out objects. There were not many of them, just two, a large steel chair in the middle of the room and a cart with metal drawers next to it. Opposite him was a wall with a single door, and he could see a strip of light penetrate from behind it. To the left and right, there were cells with square doors in three tiers, and he was in one of them. Somehow, his cell had opened, and the metal pallet he was on had extended forward. The cold was bone-chilling. Mateo could now sit up. His body reluctantly obeyed his wishes. He cautiously lowered his legs off the pallet and touched the tiled floor, which glistened with puddles of water. BRR. He hugged himself. His teeth were grinding. What on earth is this place? Is it really a mortuary? He had only seen similar scenes in movies, and if one could trust the imagination of designers and directors, morgues should look exactly like this. In the center of the room, corpses were dissected on a table. On the cart were syringes, saws, scalpels, and clamps, and the cells were nothing more than refrigerators with bodies. But what had happened to him? Or was this already a post-mortem experience? Mateo pinched his leg, he could feel pain. Or maybe these were phantom pains, like in people with amputated limbs. They didn't have any limbs, but the darn thing still itched. He finally climbed off the pallet and clumsily shuffled towards the door, his plastic tag clinking on the big toe of his foot. The door was unlocked. Mateo pushed it open slightly and peered into the corridor. No one was in sight. A soft LED light from a single lamp illuminated the area. He decided to go to the right, hoping to find someone who could explain this surreal situation. The stiffness from the unbearable cold was gradually subsiding. He looked at himself. He was wearing a green gown with two ties at the back. The corridor turned to the right, and at the end of it, Matteo finally spotted a person. It was a young security guard in uniform, sitting with headphones on, engrossed in something on a laptop screen. Matteo reached out his hands and attempted a semblance of a joyful smile, but something went wrong. The security guard, raising his eyes to Matteo for a couple of seconds, froze with widened eyes and promptly lost consciousness, collapsing to the floor. Matteo didn't expect this turn of events. He lifted the guard, seated him back in the chair, and listened to his breathing. He was breathing, thank goodness. He was a bit faint-hearted, it seemed. Matteo turned the laptop screen toward himself. In the evening twilight across a foggy field, hordes of semi-decayed zombies roamed. Now everything made sense. 
Perhaps even he would have fainted if a similar creature with outstretched arms had emerged from the screen. Nevertheless, he needed to somehow receive answers to his questions. Mateo closed the movie, searched among the icons for something resembling a document directory, and found a label that said clients. That might be what he needed. He double-clicked. A table filled with numbers, surnames, addresses, and more appeared on the screen. He looked for his number. There it was, Matteo Polito. Cause of death, a dash, address, promenade, 43, apartment 17, and contacts, Lucretia and her phone number. So, that's who he was. Someone named Matteo Polito, well, at least he knew his last name. And Lucretia Gill. Lucretia. Memories flashed back to him. Was she his wife? Yes, she was, and then, there was emptiness again. At least he now knew his address and had someone ask for details his brain refused to recall. Mateo listened to the security guards breathing again, just to be sure. He didn't want to switch roles with anyone, it would be a sin to take advantage, but he seemed to be alive. He searched through the guards' pockets, found his phone, ran through the contacts, located a taxi service, and made a call taxi anywhere i'm listening a nasal feminine voice answered i need a ride mateo croaked hardly recognizing himself where are we going promenade 43 where should i pick you up at the morgue she paused for a moment sir it was evident she was slightly annoyed are you drunk or are you just making jokes Girl, I'm sober, and believe me, I'm not inclined to joke at all. I am in a morgue, not at a liquor factory. What's so unusual here? In which morgue, sir? Do we have many morgues in our town? The hospital morgue. Familiar surroundings came to mind right on time. A one-story building next to the clinic. Okay, the girl's voice lost its emotions again. Confirmed the call. Wait for a couple of minutes. Thanks. I will. Mateo sighed with relief, took a few bills from the security guard's wallet, mentally apologized to the unfamiliar guy, and walked towards the exit. However, the door was locked. Well, of course. Why keep it wide open? He returned to the table, pulled out the drawers, and found the keys, spending a minute picking the right one. Meanwhile, the taxi had arrived. Promenade, 43, Matteo calmly said as he settled into the back seat. The driver examined him curiously in the rearview mirror. Does my appearance bother you? Matteo asked, handing him the money. No need for change. I've seen stranger things in life, the driver replied, more to reassure himself than anything else. All sorts of things happen. Then let's go, Mateo concluded. My wife's been waiting. Although it was early in the morning, walking barefoot on the wet road from the taxi to the entrance was far from comfortable. Fortunately, the streets were not yet crowded, there was no sign of a janitor, and no one caught Mateo in his unusual state. Approaching the intercom, he dialed the apartment number. He had to wait for a response for a long time. Finally, his wife's sleepy and slightly annoyed voice crackled. Yes? Lucretia, it's me. He immediately recognized his wife's voice. Another wave of fresh memories flashed through his mind, the wedding, the white wedding dress, and the drunken guests with smudged faces. Who is this? The wife asked somewhat impatiently. Your husband, Matteo. There was a brief pause. Something clattered. Could she have fainted too? Sir, she continued with irritation, are you in your right mind or are you making jokes? I'll call the police right now. Lucretia, Matteo almost shouted. What kind of jokes are you talking about? It's me. I'm here. Can't you recognize your husband's voice? Open the door, I'll explain everything, although I haven't fully figured it out myself. Please, Lucretia. Even through the intercom, he noticed that Lucretia was getting worried. It's me, Matteo. Listen, darling, I'm almost naked here, freezing like a dog. 
What else can I say to make you believe me? Well, you have a mole on your left breast. Is that right? There was silence. Lucretia, who else could know such details? Now Matteo himself was getting worried. Or can they? Lucretia, you said I was your first. I proposed to you when we went to the sea with Santis at that cafe. What was it called? By the sea? I think. Yes, by the sea. Okay, the voice agreed. I'm going to open the door. But if this turns out to be a joke. The lock clicked. Mateo rushed up the stairs and stopped outside apartment number 17. The door wasn't opened immediately. Apparently, his wife was looking through the peephole. Finally, the door swung open. Matteo entered the hallway. My God, Lucretia exclaimed. How is this even possible? And she rushed to hug him. Come on, Matteo pushed her away. You'll have plenty of time for tears. Right now, I need a bath to get rid of this whole charade. Yes, of course. I'll get it ready, Lucretia said. She went into the bathroom turned on the shower, then hurried to the bedroom, found some more decent clothes in the closet, grabbed a towel, and returned to him. Here, she handed him a handful of clothes. It's from the late husband. Stop it, Matteo cursed and rubbed his temple. What late husband? Shame on you for even mentioning it. Oh, I'm so flustered, Lucretia said. Matteo took off his gown, took the clothes from Lucretia, and headed into the bathroom. The hot water jets finally brought him to his senses. Now he remembered everything, well, almost everything. He couldn't recall how he ended up in the morgue, though. The wedding was just yesterday, July 23rd, and today they were supposed to have the second day of festivities at Namija's house. Yes, Namija's. The last thing he remembered was saying goodbye at her house. Sergio Vega had given them a lift to finalize plans for the second day. Sergio didn't drink at all, he had quit two years ago, but Matteo had indulged himself at the end of the celebration, demanding a sip of Namesia's strange liquor brought back from Thailand half a year ago, complete with a real snake inside. He drank it, and, and that was it, a blank space, and he woke up in the mortuary refrigerator. He looked at himself in the mirror. Either he was so blue from a hangover or from what he had been through. Surprisingly, his head didn't hurt at all, as if he hadn't drunk at all. Matteo quickly shaved, washed his hair, and returned to his wife, slightly pinker in complexion. You didn't call anyone, did you? He suddenly realized. When? While I was taking a shower, did you call anyone? No, I haven't. I didn't even get a chance to call anyone yesterday to let them know what happened, that you, well, suddenly passed away. Lucretia, please watch your mouth. We're married now, after all. Yes, sorry, my love. I'm just not myself, I don't know what I'm saying. In any case, no one knows about your death or your resurrection. That's good. Tell me, how did I end up in the morgue? Sergio drove us home from Nemesia's. You took a shower, started to sober up a bit, and were getting ready to go to bed, but you didn't make it three steps to the bed and collapsed on the carpet like you'd been knocked out. Of course, I immediately called an ambulance and they took about 20 minutes to arrive. I saw you turning blue and not breathing, so I ran around the room like a fool, muttering, oh, God, and oh, God. In the end, they arrived, looked at you, and said it was too late. About 10 minutes later, the coroner's van came, loaded you up, and left. I gave the guys a bottle so they would take care of you properly. They said, Wait for the police tomorrow, or rather, later today. What time is it now? Lucretia checked her phone. Half past five. Listen, Matteo had a sudden suspicion. Did anyone else drink that liquor Namesia served me besides me? Marcelo Santiago did. He joined us. Is he alive? What are you thinking, anyway? Do you suspect Namesia was trying to poison you? I don't know what to think anymore. I've always been healthy as a bull. Why would I suddenly go into a coma after seven shots, even if it was a short one? 
Well, anything can happen. Remember David Soto? How he, when he was helping his dad build the veranda. Oh, not now, Mateo interrupted her. What does David Soto have to do with this? I know my own condition in detail. There were no reasons for my life to end. So, is Marcelo alive? Who knows? Yesterday evening, he and Giorgio went fishing at Holy Lake, said they'd be gone for three days. We need to call and find out. We can't do it. Why not? There's never any signal out there. Remember when Giorgio and I went there once? We couldn't reach anyone. I remember some things, but my memory is foggy in other places. But I think if something had happened to Marcelo, Giorgio would have found a way to contact the outside world by now. I'll call his wife later. Call her, but don't tell anyone about me yet. Okay. What are you thinking? I'll go check on Namesia and talk to her. She's always been involved in strange things. Matteo and Lucretia continued their conversation, trying to piece together the events of the previous day and make sense of Matteo's sudden appearance in the morgue. What do you mean? She's a writer, you see. She spends about half a year traveling to foreign places, and then the other half of the year, she shuts herself in her house and disconnects her phones. She writes novels. Are her novels any good? I haven't read them, so I don't know. So, you won't find her at home now. Why not? They were planning to celebrate the second day there. They were planning to, but she said she's flying to Cambodia in the morning, and her ticket has been booked for a while. She also strictly forbade anyone from staying in the house without her supervision. Well, that's a shame, Mateo sighed. But I don't remember any of this. Nevertheless, I'll go. Maybe I'll still catch her at home. What should I do? Lucretia asked, concerned. For now, don't do anything. Cancel the second day. Tell them I got seriously ill and that I was taken to the regional hospital or something like that. And don't forget to call Giorgio's wife. I'll use the old mobile phone that's registered under your mom's name and I'll call you closer to noon. Why not use your own? Because the police officers are going to come, remember? Don't tell them anything either. Just say you don't know anything. They took me to the morgue yesterday, and I've been grieving bitterly for my spouse since this morning. Oh my goodness, Lucretia buried her face in her hands. I'm a terrible liar. You're a grieving widow. No one will question you. Okay, I'm off. Mateo made his way to the garage through the fields and started his old car. He followed the back roads until he reached the main road, which would take him to Namesia's house in about 15 minutes. Leaving the car on a small hill surrounded by young pines and firs, he walked the remaining 300 meters, trying to avoid being seen by anyone. In this area, most of the houses were used as summer cottages, and only Aunt Namesia's neat little house stood out among the neighboring structures as an elite mansion, clearly intended not just for temporary residents. It was a place to live, and even better, to make a statement to envious onlookers. Mateo entered from the back, reached the door, and rang the bell. Silence. He knocked, but there was no sound of movement inside, so it seemed he had not arrived in time. Well, perhaps that was even better. In his childhood, his mother often sent Mateo to his aunt, sometimes even for the entire summer, if Aunt Namesia happened to be in her phase of reclusion during that season. Aunt Namesia was not particularly talkative. She was immersed in her creative work, prepared breakfast and lunch hastily, often forgot about dinner, and then she disappeared again into her study, so Mateo was mostly left on his own. He didn't mind his solitude, though, and he relished the freedom he had to create mirages in the surrounding space, imagining himself as a castle prisoner or a ship's captain stranded on a deserted island. He felt comfortable here. Despite its modest size for such structures, the house seemed enormous to him, filled with secret rooms, labyrinthine twists, and monsters lurking in every dark corner. Perhaps, through the power of his imagination, he had actually gone to Nemesia's. Or maybe this was common to all children. 
He didn't know this yet because he and Lucretia didn't want to think about their own children for a couple of years. They had decided to live for themselves, to grow used to each other, so to speak, and to let their family life settle in. Knowing all the secrets of this house like the back of his hand, Matteo walked back to the rear facade. There was a small extension there where garden tools and various jars for pickling vegetables were stored. Aunt Namesia never really did any gardening herself. In her youth, she may have had such intentions, which is why she bought all this junk that ultimately proved unnecessary. Inside the extension, there was a secret passage into the house, leading to a separate room that Mateo had turned into his pirate Tortuga 15 years ago. Anything peculiar and unwanted by anyone but him was stored in this secret place. When he lit a kerosene lamp in the evenings, he would take an old crutch he found in the attic once and parade around his treasures, imagining himself as a lone long John Silver. If Aunt Namesia ever found out that he was using matches and kerosene from the pantry, that crutch would serve her quite well as an instrument of punishment. But nobody knew about this place. It wasn't in the architectural plans, except Olivia. She was a couple of years younger than him. Sometimes she would stay here until the stars came out. Matteo would tell her stories of distant tropical lands, of battles where his brave sailors boarded English ships, and of the tropical heat amid enraged baboons and hungry hyenas. Olivia listened to his tales with her mouth wide open, and then they kissed, with the innocence and clumsiness of youth, but with the sincerity that only adults can dream of. However, it was not the time for reminiscing. Matteo frowned and shook his head, shaking off the web of visions that had ensnared him. He needed to act. The door to the extension still had the same lock that Matteo remembered from his childhood. Aunt Namesia had apparently abandoned her inventory entirely and had not entered here ever since. This lock had one characteristic that only Matteo knew. If you pressed the latch and then pulled it down abruptly, the lock would open without the need for a key. He didn't get it on the first try, having lost his former agility. But on the second try, the lock yielded. The door sagged a bit, so Matteo could only open it halfway. In the semi-darkness, stumbling over a rake with a spade, Matteo found the hidden door, and now he was inside the house. He was listening carefully, there was silence, and he could feel the unchanging, special aroma that had been here for a long time. First and foremost, Matteo was interested in the tincture, but he couldn't find it in the fridge. Matteo went down to the basement and searched among the few other bottles of various drinks. And there it was, a cobweb-covered yellow bottle with a serpent coiled on the bottom. He uncorked it and sniffed, the wine fumes hit him like smelling salts. Matteo wrinkled his nose in a disgusted grimace and almost dropped the tincture. What filth! How could he have possibly drunk this yesterday? Even without poison, such a concoction would knock out any healthy person. He needed to pour a bit for analysis. Matteo had an old acquaintance, Lamberto Borrego, a former microbiologist who had once worked in a secret laboratory in the capital. The laboratory had closed for some reason, and Lamberto had returned to his hometown, taking a meager salary at the local hospital and gradually succumbing to alcoholism. There was no doubt about his talents in chemistry because, even in school, he never ceased to amaze his classmates with scientific wonders. The chemistry teacher couldn't always explain the laws behind Lamberto's sensational experiments. In general, Lamberto should help, although Matteo hadn't seen him in five years or more, and it was unclear whether he was even alive or if he had gone somewhere in pursuit of a better salary. But that was the plan for now. On one of the shelves, Matteo found a dusty jar that seemed clean and odorless. He poured a bit of the liquor from the bottle into it, closed it with a nylon lid, and, satisfied with his work, went back upstairs. In principle, he could have left, but something held Matteo back, an idea that had not yet fully formed. After all, if Aunt Namesia, for some reason, in his fantastic and absurd suggestion, decided to send him to the afterlife, there could be clues in the house about the circumstances that prompted her to do so. She couldn't have gone insane, and there could have been some random occurrence. For example, she might not have been aware of the poisonous content of the bottle and simply wanted to surprise her nephew with an exotic drink. Such an explanation seemed the most logical to him. 
However, since there was currently no way to ask Aunt Namesia about it, other pretexts could also be considered. Mateo walked into the office where his aunt used to immerse herself in her work. He had never been there before because this place was off limits to everyone except, of course, the muses, which were invisible to the eye. The office was so cozy and inviting that the thought of Aunt Namesia being a poisoner seemed completely absurd to Mateo. He approached the massive writing desk, ran his hand over its green velvet surface, and turned on the desk lamp. Perhaps, in this room, he could write a novel himself if he remembered how to hold a pen at all. He had become so accustomed to the keyboard that he doubted he could recall how to write in cursive. Namesia preferred an old German typewriter. Mateo pressed the L key cautiously, and a pleasant thud lightly hit the paper, leaving a neat imprint. He smiled, thinking that he should have called Lucretia to find out how Marcello and Giorgio were doing. It was almost noon, but his attention immediately shifted to a transparent, light blue folder with a sheet inside. Through the plastic, a small text and a round seal at the bottom were visible. He took the sheet from the folder and began to read. Last Will and Testament I, Gabriel Castro, by this will, make the following disposition, all my property, whatever it may consist of and wherever it may be, I bequeath to Matteo Polito. This last will and testament is made in duplicate. A signature, a few lines of text from a notary, and a seal. Black circles blurred before Matteo's eyes, and he couldn't finish reading it. And what else was there to read? Everything was clear now. Although it wouldn't fit into his head, how can this be? Aunt Namesia, my dear, we've been living under the same roof for so many years. After my mother's death, there's been no one in the whole wide world except you. A cold, miserly tear trickled down his cheek. Indeed, if he had died yesterday for real, it would mean that only his aunt or wife remained as the direct heir. Does a wife automatically become the closest heir after the death of a spouse? Mateo wasn't well-versed in such legal intricacies. However, if his wife knew nothing about the will, you could certainly arrange such affairs with a cunning notary or someone who knows their way around the matter for a good amount of money. He couldn't entertain the thought that Lucretia was in cahoots with Nemesia. It didn't even cross his mind to suspect his beloved wife. Moreover, all this seemed too crude to poison him with homemade liquor in their own home and in the presence of witnesses. She could, of course, claim that she knew nothing about the properties of the serpent liquor herself. No one but Aunt Namesia saw the wool among the locals, and therefore, no one would detect a motive. She could have waited for some time and gradually manipulated the legal side of things in her favor. It was risky, of course, but as they say, he who doesn't risk doesn't have a seaside villa. Perhaps they were inheriting fortunes with nine zeros and mansions in Europe. And who was this Gabriel Castro anyway? Mateo had never heard this name before. He had never even heard of a relative with such a surname. Maybe he wasn't even a relative at all, perhaps just a secret admirer from his mother's past, or maybe. After all, he had never seen his father. His mother had told him that she had separated from him when she was still pregnant with Mateo. Could it really be his father? But why should he have cracked his brain now? He needed to act while Aunt Namesia was still away in Cambodia. And how carelessly she had treated this document, tossing it onto the table, collecting her belongings, and leaving for the ends of the earth as if it were an ordinary occurrence in her life. Or perhaps it might indeed have been an ordinary occurrence. Who knew what business she was involved in under the guise of being a writer? Oh, Aunt Namesia, you've truly managed to surprise me this time, he thought to himself. Now, with this document, he needed to consult a lawyer to verify if everything was as it seemed at first glance. But first, he had to go to the hospital and hand over the jar of poisonous tincture to Lamberto for analysis. Meanwhile, in Lucretia's apartment, the expected phone call came. At the doorstep, there were two men. One was a tall blonde man with the rank of chief, and the other was a slender, quite young man in plain clothes, with a sad expression and a thin folder in one hand. Chief Valerio Nieto. He presented his identification to Lucretia, deliberately speaking with a confident tone. Are you Lucretia Polito? 
Yes, I am, Lucretia breathed, trying to regain control of her racing thoughts. Please let us come in, the blonde continued. We need to ask you a few questions. Yes, of course, come in, Lucretia stepped aside and closed the door as the guests entered the hallway. I apologize for such an early visit, the chief continued. We understand that you may not have fully recovered from yesterday. It's all right, Lucretia interrupted him. I understand. Come into the living room. Have a seat. I will try to answer all your questions. Besides, I have some questions for you as well. Certainly, the blonde agreed, gesturing for his partner to follow, and then sat down in a chair, inviting Lucretia to do the same. Lucretia, we have two pieces of news for you. As a custom, one is good and the other is not. Lucretia looked at him attentively, expecting some sort of catch. The good news is that your husband, Matteo, is not dead at all, the chief said, looking closely at Lucretia. She paled, trying to anticipate what the most natural reaction would be in this situation, but she couldn't think of anything. She felt a sense of self-reproach and a realization that, from the very first moment, despite her careful planning, she had failed her role. Lucretia simply burst into tears, smudging the already eerie makeup on her face. Lucretia, what's wrong? The chief was surprised, gently touching her shoulder. Why are you crying? Maybe you misunderstood me. I said he's alive. Do you hear me? Alive? Lucretia sobbed, wiping her face with her palms. How can he be alive? It seemed she had managed to find the right tone after all. Just like that. Strangely enough, but still alive. We actually came here because of that. So, where is he then, if he's alive? Lucretia asked, wiping her nose with a handkerchief. That's what we'd like to know, the chief calmly continued. We wanted to ask if he had come home or if there had been any calls from him. No, no one called, Lucretia muttered quietly, sniffling. And what's the bad news, then? I don't understand anything. Well, it's not exactly bad news, but it does require clear answers. Lucretia shrugged. You know, when it was just starting to get light, there was a strange call. I see, the chief perked up. His partner pulled out a notebook and prepared to take notes. But it wasn't a phone call, Lucretia continued, it was a call on the intercom. I asked who was there, and they answered. I feel so stupid. Lucretia was ready to let a tear escape again, but thought it might be too much. They told me it was Matteo. Can you imagine how nervous I was? The wedding, the ambulance, the morgue. But the voice didn't sound anything like my husband's. It was some drunken guy, maybe one of the guests, playing a joke, not knowing that Matteo was at the morgue. But I didn't want to explain anything, and I didn't want to see anyone. I sent that guy away and disconnected the intercom. So, it turns out that Matteo was probably calling. At that moment, her mobile phone rang. Lucretia jumped and reached for the phone. Chief Valerio Nieto gently grabbed her hand. Let me see who's calling, okay? He asked, trying to sound as gentle as possible. Lucretia shrugged again. The chief looked at the screen. There was a call from mom. He nodded approvingly and handed the phone to Lucretia. Hi, Mom. Lucretia put the phone in her ear. Don't worry, Mom, I'm fine. Yes, everything's okay. I got through to Giorgio's wife, Giorgio didn't call. Okay, Mom, I'll call you later. I'm with an investigator right now. It's not a good time. All right? Goodbye. Why didn't you tell your mom that your husband is alive? The chief asked. Can you? Maybe it's some kind of classified matter, Lucretia replied, pretending to look surprised. Why not? He's not a criminal or anything. He just disappeared without any apparent reason. Anyway, I'm leaving you my contact information. The chief placed his business card on the table. If there are any updates, please call me anytime. The chief stood up, adjusted his cap over his blonde hair, nodded slightly, and headed for the exit. 
His colleague followed him. Lucretia closed the door behind the guests, breathed out all the tension that had built up, and sat down right there in the hallway. She seemed to have handled her role with flying colors. There were no material-related contacts in her mother's phone except for her and her mother. As for Lamberto Borrego, Mateo had to go to the hospital to find him at his workplace. Mateo felt like a criminal, or at least an American spy, even though he hadn't done anything illegal except for leaving the morgue without permission. What could they charge him with if they caught him right now? Stealing a hospital gown? Fainting of a security guard? Walking around town inappropriately dressed? Still, common sense in his case gave way to an intuitive conviction that the best thing for now was to stay away from any unwanted encounters. Mateo got lucky. He didn't even have to enter the hospital building. As soon as he caught up to him, stopping at the pedestrian crossing, he ran into Lamberto. He had just finished work and was waiting at the traffic light to cross the road. He looked a bit disheveled. Mateo honked and waved his hand to get Lamberto's attention. Lamberto, hi, Mateo said hurriedly, getting out of the car. Did you recognize me? Hi, Mateo. Yes, I did. Listen, there are some rumors about you going around. Get in, and I'll give you a ride wherever you want. We can talk on the way. Lamberto thought quickly, just as he used to do in school, he hadn't lost his youthful wit. He jumped into the front seat just as the light turned yellow. Mateo hit the gas pedal. Where do you need to go? Mateo asked. I was heading home, but it's not a must. No one's waiting for me there. I could just ride around with you aimlessly. Why are you leaving work so early? Lunch just ended not too long ago, or are you on shifts, like at a factory? I'm on half shift today. There's hardly any work right now. Either cut back hours or lay people off, but cutting back hours is easier. Finding the right specialists afterward is a problem. At the wages they're paying, who'd want to deal with all these critters? I mean, do you know how many diseases are in the products? Lamberto clarified. They won't tell you that on TV to avoid scaring people. Watch it long enough and you'll stop eating altogether. See how thin I've become. Yes, I noticed. You think I'm drinking? Well, not exactly. I disinfect myself once a month. It's a kind of chemotherapy. But why am I talking about work all the time? Forget it. How are you doing? I heard today that you joined the majority right after the wedding, but I see you're alive and well. Mateo laughed. The rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. People can come up with all sorts of things, can't they? I'm alive. You can touch me if you want. Actually, I was on my way to see you. I left my phone with all the contacts at home. I have a matter to discuss with you. Is it related to chemistry? Exactly, confirmed Matteo. I don't know any other specialists in that field. I'm not the same person I used to be back in college. I deal more with analysis now. That's exactly what I need. Analysis? Yes. Matteo turned into an alley and stopped near a store. Here. He pulled a bottle of the liqueur from the glove compartment. Can you check the composition? It looks like urine. Lamberto hesitated to take the flask from Matteo. Don't worry, reassured Matteo. It's not urine. It's a 40-degree overseas liquor. We drank it yesterday, as you can see, but I'd like to know the exact composition. There are essential oils, organic inclusions, and all the details, especially regarding the poisons. All right, Lamberto agreed. Could you put it in a bag or something? Oh yes, of course, Matteo realized. He grabbed a bag from the floor behind the back seats, placed the bottle inside, and handed it to Lamberto. Will you do it? No problem. Lamberto took the bottle, albeit reluctantly. When do you need the results? How long does the analysis take, if done minimally but thoroughly? Two to three days, four at most. Okay. How much do I owe you? Nothing at all. Come on, Mateo, why would you say that? 
Although we haven't seen each other in a while, it hasn't stopped me from being a comrade. I'll do it all in the best way as a tribute to our past. I see you haven't changed at all, Mateo summed up and shook Lamberto's hand firmly. So where can I drop you off? Home now, if it's not too much trouble. Where else would I go with these samples? Just give me your phone number, and I'll call you. After dropping off Lamberto, Mateo set out in search of a lawyer. Looking for him in his own town was quite dangerous, in the sense that rumors about the inheritance would quickly spread. Just yesterday, he had died, and today even Lamberto knew about it. The town was not entirely small, but there were many people who were somehow acquainted with each other. However, time was running out. All the offices would close at 5 o'clock, and waiting until tomorrow was neither patient nor possible. Time was not on his side at the moment. Mateo stumbled upon one of the law firms as soon as he turned from the alley onto the avenue. A stout man in his mid-forties introduced himself as Jacinto Aguilar. After exchanging the customary pleasantries, they finally got down to business. He examined the wool thoroughly, huffing, scrutinizing it even through a magnifying glass, raising his eyebrows in surprise, and then gently placed the document on the table and said with a smile, I don't see anything unnatural here. And Matteo Polito, is it you? Yes. Matteo decided to be straightforward to avoid the need for deception. All right, the lawyer mumbled while stroking the document with his meaty palm. Let me check the database. He dove into the computer, skillfully navigating the keyboard. Matteo thought that maybe he had made a mistake by bringing his will here. What if there were tools available to locate him in such times with such convoluted laws, each of which undoubtedly had a dozen sub-laws that contradicted the original intent? Jacinto unexpectedly whistled, causing Matteo to jump in his chair. What? He asked in a startled tone. It turns out that Gabriel Castro is a highly respected figure in some rather extraordinary circles. What does that mean? He's a very wealthy man, I must say. Are you aware of what you're going to inherit? Not entirely. I've only met Gabriel twice. This time, Matteo decided to lie. And both times, I only learned about it from others. I don't understand, the lawyer said, looking suspicious. The first time, he came to the maternity ward when I was born. The second time, it was when I had an accident and was unconscious in a room he had rented for me. Yes, your relationship seems quite peculiar, Jacinto concluded. He's the owner of the construction company, three restaurants in the capital and a major city, a book publishing house, and a chain of elite salons in Prague, Vilnius, and Budapest. And that's not the entire list. So, Gabriel is a rich man, Matteo almost whispered. Young man, it's no longer Gabriel, it's you. Gabriel will be buried tomorrow. You should hurry so you can express your condolences and mingle among the elite. Find out, so to speak, their sentiments regarding you. I'm sure you understand. I do, Matteo nodded, not really understanding much at this point. I have another question, he added. Well, don't consider this strange, but if, let's say, I accidentally die, who will then become the heir? The closest relative. This is called inheritance transmission. Transmission. Isn't that just like in a car? And is a wife considered the closest relative? Yes, she is considered the closest, along with your brothers, sisters, and children. I see. Mateo's thoughts were becoming more and more tangled. There's one thing that bothers me in this document, the lawyer said thoughtfully. And what is it? The registered address of your uncle. It says here that he's registered on Central Street, house number 6. That's in the Empire Complex in the capital. And why does it make you worry? Because only apartments without the possibility of registration are rented there, as in one's own residential premises. I must say, the prices are sky high, up to 100 million and more, and you can't get registered there. That's the deal. However, with such money and connections. Yes, there are rumors that they might allow apartment registration in the future. 
Perhaps your uncle was just a bit ahead of his time, just enough to make his life more comfortable. Oh, may he rest in peace, of course. Of course, Matteo agreed. So, you think it's necessary for me to be present at the funeral? Absolutely, the lawyer shrugged. How else? Not attending the funeral of your uncle, who took care of you after that terrible accident, would be the height of ingratitude, especially in the eyes of those who would rightfully claim his inheritance if Gabriel hadn't written you into his will. Jacinto glanced at his computer monitor once more. I suppose you won't make it to the actual funeral. The nearest express train to the capital departs at 2230, and you'll arrive in the capital at 9 in the morning. So be it. Come directly to the memorial service. It will be held at Gabriel's country estate in the village near the capital. Please be cautious. I honestly don't envy you. People are willing to do anything for that kind of money, especially when they have all the necessary means to do so. Matteo turned pale, fully understanding the danger of his current situation. Nonetheless, he had to see this through to the end. At the very least, if the danger proved to be more than real, he could renounce the inheritance, not in its entirety, of course, but a significant portion of it. Why would he need all these factories and steamships? He didn't understand anything about such matters anyway. He'd be happy with 10 million, or, let's say, 30 million. Yes, 30 million would be enough for him. He could even find a small apartment in the capital, not in the city center, of course, but even better. He could go mushroom picking and fishing and seriously think about starting a family. He already had a car, and he could always get to work. Fresh air was better for little children. What was there to do in the city center in the summer heat? He might even build himself a decent house in the countryside with that kind of money. Building his own house was a good idea. Like the one Aunt Namesia had. Damn, Aunt Namesia. If you took a serious approach to the problem, it wasn't really about the money, it was about justice. The truth should have prevailed. In Namesia's case, she could be forgiven. People can get confused in their old age and forgiven in memory of the cloudless past. After all, she did some good things for him back then. That's what he decided for himself. Thank you very much, Jacinto. How much do I owe you? You don't owe me anything, the lawyer said, leaning back in his chair, taking off his glasses, satisfied with himself. We'll settle up when you inherit. I believe you'll have even more questions afterward, so feel free to come back to see me. I'll be happy to help. Thank you, Matteo thanked him once more and left the office. Already in his car, he decided to call Lucretia. She picked up quickly. So, Lucretia, did they pressure you a lot? Hi, Matteo. Yes, I managed to handle it. Then they came back again, asking if I had a car. I told them I can't drive, and I don't even know where the keys to the garage and your car are. So they dragged me to show them the garage. They called some kind of locksmith, and he unlocked it in front of witnesses. There was no car. Neighbors are all curious, thinking you did something because of what's going on with the garage break-in. But I don't know what to tell them. I can't say you're dead, that you've come back to life, or that you've run off. Who knows where and why? How about you? When will you be home? Maybe you should go to the police station yourself. Explain everything. I can't, Lucretia, I can't. There's such a detective story going on here that the final scene won't happen anytime soon. What do you mean, another scene? Mateo, can you explain everything properly to me? I can't right now. It's not something we should discuss over the phone. Oh, come on, Mateo, stop playing the spy. Tell me everything as it is, or I'll go crazy soon. Mateo's wife's words slightly offended him. I'm not playing anything. You'll see for yourself later. Don't get all worked up. Everything is going according to plan. I need to go somewhere for a couple of days, and then I'll definitely come back and tell you everything, even if I have to go to the police station. Oh, Mateo, his wife sighed. I don't know what you made up in your head, but I'll be worried sick anyway. That's just my nature. Do whatever you think is best, 
and remember that your photos are already hanging on every lamppost in the city. You're considered a missing person. Oh my. Thanks for letting me know. Okay, later, everything will be fine. Mateo had to visit a wig shop. They had one of those in their town, and in addition to wigs, they crafted all sorts of costumes. Once, on Halloween, he and Lucretia decided to shop there to amuse their guests. It was the previous year. Scanning the columns and billboards carefully, Mateo made his way to the shop. He chose a 70s style wig and a matching mustache, trying them on. He looked like a complete idiot, as if he had escaped from a retro disco party, but it was better than being himself right now. There were no idiots on the wanted list. He also bought a costume that resembled a tuxedo more than any other. He neatly folded the suit into a bag. In the queue at the train station, no one paid attention to him. Whether due to a sudden dislike for the indifferent crowd or a sense of self-importance because of his thoughts of impending wealth, he didn't want to buy a ticket for an ordinary train or even a coupe. He bought a luxury ticket. He could tolerate having one neighbor. After all, it was only a one-night journey to the capital. He only had enough money left in his wallet for the return trip and a little extra for unforeseen expenses. Fatigue hit him all at once as soon as he entered his compartment. His compartment mate turned out to be a fairly attractive girl, around 25 years old, reading a thick book and showing no signs of curiosity. That was good. If it had been a guy, he would have had to start some conversation one way or another. He didn't feel like talking about anything. His legs were buzzing, his head was pounding, and his thoughts were tangled, chasing each other away. So Mateo couldn't concentrate on anything specific. He went to the restroom to wash up, undressed while the girl was also off somewhere, laid down, and within a second, he fell into a deep, troubled sleep, interrupted only by the jolts and clatter of the carriages at infrequent stops. Mateo woke up as abruptly as he had fallen asleep the night before. The first thing he saw in front of him was the girl, who, with her hands folded on her knees and without moving, was regarding him with suspicion. It was clear from everything that she hadn't slept at all. This didn't surprise Mateo, because when he put himself in her shoes, he could see things more clearly. His wig had slipped off, and his mustache was halfway off. What could one expect from a guy like him if you suddenly found yourself alone with him in a closed space in the middle of the night? Anything could happen, of course, but the scene looked not so ominous as ambiguous. Oh, Mateo exclaimed, adjusting his wig. Good morning. I apologize. Please don't think anything bad about me. I'm going to a film shoot. I got into character yesterday and apparently fell asleep like this, he blurted out, stating the first thing that came to mind. I should have explained myself to you yesterday. Yes, you scared me, the girl said in a low voice. What movie is this? I'm playing a man in a retro project. The working title of the film is Daddies from the Past. Good Lord, the girl exclaimed, raising her hand slightly, what will they come up with next? It's nostalgia for the past. Tell me about it, people have gone crazy. By the way, my name is Tobias, Mateo lied again, unable to stop himself. And I'm Wanda. Nice to meet you. So, do you have a leading role or something? Oh, no, not at all. Mateo removed his mustache, took off the wig, and fixed his hair. It's a supporting role, and it's possible they might cut my scene altogether. But I try to take my work seriously, no matter what. That's the right attitude. I'm studying to be a screenwriter myself. I'm traveling to take an exam, and I'll be heading back home tonight. Really? What year are you in? I'm in my fourth year. That's great. Maybe you'll write a decent screenplay someday. After all, most of the time, we end up acting in B-grade stuff. Who wrote the screenplay for your movie? I actually don't know. They only gave me a few scenes with my lines. That's a shame, but I'll definitely watch it when it comes out. You'll see it in a year and a half, I think. The train arrived exactly on time. After discussing the unfortunate fate of the local film industry with Wanda, they parted almost as friends, laughing at the absurd circumstances of their meeting. 
Mateo wished her success on her exam, paid her a few compliments, but politely declined exchanging contact information, citing the fact that he had accidentally taken the wrong phone in his haste and couldn't remember his own number by heart. Mateo went to the restroom at the train station. Locking himself in a stall, he changed into the suit and stowed away his old clothes along with the mustache and wig in the luggage storage. The electric train was leaving in 15 minutes. The rain had stopped, and the day was taking on a gloomy, appropriate appearance for a memorial service, but it also filled Mateo with uneasy premonitions. He double-checked to make sure he had his money, passport, and wool with him. The documents were in place. In the village, he quickly hailed a taxi. The driver quoted a fare higher than Mateo had expected. Given the circumstances, it seemed that he wouldn't have any money left for the return journey, but it didn't matter. He could figure something out. The ride took him quite far. From the highway, flanked on both sides by young spruces and pines, they turned onto a forest road, gently paved with small, moisture-glistening gravel. About two kilometers down the road, they reached massive iron gates that didn't open immediately. The rain had stopped dripping. In front of Mateo lay a magnificent three-story mansion with an elegant staircase, white balustrades, columns along the facade, and marble figures of elves in deep niches between the windows on the first floor. A working fountain graced the center of the circular clearing in front of the mansion. Lavish cars were parked everywhere there was free space. The gray Renault, which had audaciously intruded into this fairy tale, looked like a pumpkin among all the splendor. The parking attendant, who was directing arriving cars, froze in place upon seeing the taxi, unsure of what to do. Just in case, he approached the unusual guests and opened the car door, scrutinizing Matteo intently. I'm sorry, Matteo exclaimed. My Cadillac broke down at the worst possible moment. As you wish, the attendant replied indifferently and held the door while Matteo awkwardly climbed out of the car. Mateo felt himself sweating from nervousness. The parking attendant also considered it beneath himself to spend more time with such a guest, so he nodded and quickly went to attend to other cars. Trying to walk with confidence, Mateo headed to the main entrance. But the more he tried to blend in with the crowd, the more he realized that he was just an ugly duckling among swans. With each step bringing him closer to the two bouncers guarding the entrance, Mateo's body grew heavier, eventually turning into a leaden doll barely able to move its limbs. When he reached the security guards, he stopped. They cast a professional gaze over him. Mateo noticed that they hadn't missed the pirate buttons on his suit. Well, they certainly know their job, Mateo thought, realizing that their mental checklist for such situations didn't include pirate buttons. As a result, the bouncers returned to a neutral mode and asked Mateo to show his invitation to the memorial service. Mateo patted his pockets, put on a distracted look, and, spreading his hands helplessly, said, You know, today has been such a crazy day. My car broke down, my wife broke her collarbone, and what about the invitation? It seems I left it in the stable. In the stable? One of the security guards asked, clearly perplexed by what he heard. I thought you wouldn't ask, Mateo sighed. Over there. He pointed in the direction of the forest. In the stable, there's hay, straw, and a small racetrack. My head is just spinning from all the worries. Fernando, check the guest list, the first security guard said, never taking his eyes off Mateo. Tell us your name, the first bouncer asked again, pulling a notepad from his pocket. Mateo Polito, Mateo said, sounding as if he were confessing to a crime. I don't have that name, the security guard concluded after quickly scanning his notes. And could you please invite the widow of the deceased? Mateo decided to get to the point. This is not the right time for an audience, young man, Fernando said sternly. I understand, Mateo agreed. But this matter is urgent and extremely important for the mistress. The second guard frowned and said convincingly, Leave the estate. What? The lead began to drain from Mateo's body, replaced by hot blood. Don't make us repeat ourselves, the second guard continued. The first guard took a step toward Mateo and extended a massive hand to grab his sleeve. What do you think you're doing? 
Mateo exclaimed sincerely. Call the widow right away. What right do you have not to let me enter the house? I can even say. But the brutes were already dragging him down the stairs. Take your hands off me. You know what? You're. You're fired. I'll make sure you won't be hired as security guards even at a daycare, he threatened. A few latecomers, who had arrived after the memorial service had begun, watched the scene with interest, but Matteo didn't notice anything, as he was filled with noble indignation. Maybe, of course, he wouldn't fire these brutes when he became the owner of the estate since they had clearly recognized him as an unwanted guest and professionals like them should be valued. However, he would definitely withhold their salaries for a couple of months, or maybe three. Yes, definitely three months. But before they reached the fountain, an elegant young lady in a luxurious black dress and holding a glass of champagne appeared on the staircase. What's going on here? She asked in a confident, ringing voice. The guards turned around and started pulling Mateo back up the stairs. About five meters from the lady, they stopped, still holding the uninvited guest by the shoulders. Let him go, she ordered. What did you want, young man? Excuse me, Mateo said, trying to contain his anger. First of all, please accept my sincere condolences. Go on, the lady said calmly, taking a sip from her glass. And next, Mateo continued. He was about to reach into his inner jacket pocket to take out the will, but the guard stopped his movement. Calm down. Let the man explain himself, Fernando warned. Mateo carefully pulled out the piece of paper from his pocket. Jacinto took it, sniffed it, unfolded it, but didn't start reading it. He left it with Mateo, went up to the lady, and handed her the document. She didn't even touch it, but glanced over it carefully, smiled, gave Mateo a brief, contemptuous look, said something quietly to Jacinto, and he rushed back into the house with the document. And who are you, Mateo Polito? The lady asked with obvious mockery in her voice. I am Matteo Polito, Matteo replied, feeling offended. So, you're not a prank, not crazy, not a clown who ran away from his circus, but just an ordinary Matteo Polito who owns this entire estate and all of my late husband's business. That's what it is. Matteo hadn't expected the widow to be a young beauty. He had imagined encountering an elderly, dignified lady. Well, she was indeed young. How could it be otherwise? An empire of business required precisely this type of spouse. That's correct, Matteo replied. Everything is written in the document in black and white. I just wanted to talk to you. I admit there might have been some mistake here. But I came here to sort everything out. Why treat me so rudely? I am an honest person and have no ulterior motives. I can fully believe that you had no ulterior motives, the lady agreed, continuing to smile mockingly. I just can't comprehend the depth of your naivety. How could you believe all this and convince yourself that this isn't someone's bluff, even by 1%? It just doesn't work like that, young man. Such things don't happen. I'm sorry, but anyone with an understanding of how these things work would consider you either a clown or an idiot. Mateo remained silent, not fully understanding what the lady was talking about. He had wanted to say something foolish, but at that moment, Jacinto rushed out of the house with the will and whispered something in the lady's ear. She smiled even more. You see, she said, I took your document quite seriously. I even distracted my lawyer from his duties to review it. And now, Mateo Polito, you can be on your way. My people will figure out who you really are, and you better hope that you end up being a fool who was misled by someone. And with that, the lady began tearing the wool into small pieces. What on earth are you doing? Mateo protested. He tried to break free from Alejandro's tight grip, but Jacinto quickly descended the stairs and delivered a massive colored stamp on Mateo's jaw. It was the last thing he saw before he plunged into darkness. He woke up on the lower bunk in the compartment of a passenger train. When he opened his eyes, he saw Wanda sitting across from him, looking at him with the same curiosity as in the morning. Deja vu, Matteo murmured, attempting to sit up, 
but he felt a sharp pain in the back of his head and lowered it back onto the pillow. I can see, Wanda said. Did something go wrong on the set? Everything went wrong, Mateo confirmed, trying to come up with yet another story. The director turned out to be too demanding. He thought the fight should look real, and I got beaten up pretty badly. I don't even remember anything. I barely recognized you, she said. You're wearing some strange costume, definitely not the style of disco parties. Ah, uh, this? Mateo looked at his bloodstained suit. It was supposed to be a masquerade party according to the plot. And you were Dracula? Mateo chuckled and winced in pain, this time from his broken nose. They didn't tell me. Maybe a shadow of Hamlet's father. You're quite funny. Oh, I'm sorry, that was an unfortunate compliment. Would you like some painkillers? I think it wouldn't hurt, Mateo replied. Wanda took out a pack of tablets from her bag, poured some mineral water into a glass, and handed it all to Mateo. He struggled to sit up, swallowed the pill, and thanked Wanda. How is you? He asked. I passed with a B. Not too bad, considering I didn't sleep last night, thinking it would be worse. And now it's already morning? Morning. We'll be there soon. I hope you had a good night's sleep this time. Like a log, Wanda grinned. I'm already used to you. I can't imagine you as anyone else. How did I end up here in the first place? Two big guys dragged you in. Ah, Fernando and his buddy, then. Mateo searched his pockets. His wallet with money, his cell phone, and his passport were all there. His old clothes with the wig and mustache were left in the storage locker, but it wasn't a big deal. Now the main thing was to get to his aunt's house, freshen up a bit, and call Lamberto. Maybe the test results were ready. Although he had said it would take two or three days, he was probably just being overly cautious or trying to add importance to the procedure. Lamberto opened the car door and froze for a moment, squinting at Matteo. Matteo? He didn't recognize him right away. You don't look like yourself at all. Who did this to you? Come on, sit down, Matteo said, not dwelling on his appearance. I had an awkward conversation with an old acquaintance. She's something, Lamberto commented as he settled into the front seat and closed the door. Don't worry, Matteo added. It has nothing to do with the matter I asked you about. She won't harm you. You've calmed me down, Lamberto said with genuine concern. So, what about the test results? Here. Lamberto handed Matteo a piece of paper. The entire composition down to the last molecule, just as you requested. Matteo took the paper and attempted to read it, but it was filled with formulas and terms he didn't understand. Come on, are you kidding me? He said. I'm not a chemistry expert. Can you explain it in simple terms? Ah, uh, right, Lamberto realized. He put on his glasses. Okay, ethyl alcohol, that's clear. Then ethyl acetate, methyl alcohol, which is a bit worse, but still within an acceptable concentration. Then acetic acid and methyl ether, respectively. Formic ethyl ether, acetic aldehyde, and some fragments of animal origin, which seems a bit strange for alcohol. Something, apparently, from the reptile family. I heard that in the East, they add snakes to alcohol as a lure for unsuspecting tourists. Yes, that's right. There was a little snake swimming in the bottle. So, can you get fatally intoxicated with such a bouquet? Unlikely. Especially since no poisons were found unless you consider alcohol itself a poison. It's all about quantity. There could also be an allergic reaction to one of the ingredients. Allergies are no joke. You could end up in a coma from anaphylactic shock. Well, Mateo sighed as he gripped the steering wheel. So you're saying a single shot could lead to a coma? It's possible. The allergen can still have an effect in small quantities for up to half an hour. Thank you, Lamberto. I owe you one. You provided valuable information. 
Don't forget to call me, Lamberto said, extending his hand for a farewell handshake. We'll meet up somewhere, and you can tell me more about what's going on with you. Of course, I will. I'll call as soon as I get everything sorted out. Well, goodbye, my friend. Thanks again. Mateo couldn't learn much more at this point. He needed to return home and explain to his wife the reason for all his adventures, and from there, see how things unfolded. The issue with the liquor was somewhat clarified. Most likely, it was an allergic reaction to foreign snakes. However, Aunt Namesia couldn't have known about this since he himself had no knowledge of it. Now, he just needed to explain the strange will. Mateo quickly arrived home, parked the car in the garage, and headed up to his apartment door. As he was about to open it, he heard voices inside, indicating that his wife was not alone. He distinctly recognized Aunt Namesia's voice. He couldn't make out what they were talking about, but their conversation sounded animated, as if they were arguing. With confidence, Mateo unlocked the door, deliberately closed it loudly behind him without taking off his shoes, and walked into the room. The two women were taken aback, staring at him in fear. My goodness, Lucretia exclaimed. Mateo, you're starting to scare me. I'll explain everything to you now, Mateo said, feeling his anger rise. Hello, my dear Aunt Namesia. Hello, nephew, Aunt Namesia replied in bewilderment. Well, how do you like it? Mateo continued, turning his head so they could scrutinize his face more closely. Who do you think did this? The question was clearly directed at Aunt Namesia. How should I know? She replied. Who else but you? Mateo exclaimed, waving his arms. And what are you doing in my home anyway? You're supposed to be in Cambodia. Aunt Namesia was nearly in tears from Mateo's aggressive demeanor. As soon as I heard that you had died, I immediately returned on the next flight, she said. Ah, so that's it, Mateo remarked. So, news of my demise managed to reach Cambodia. Your accomplishments are truly remarkable, Lord. Imagine me lying dead. Was there an obituary on the BBC? Lucretia interjected into the conversation. Why are you attacking Aunt Namesia? What's gotten into you? Are you drunk? Yeah, I got drunk on Aunt Namesia's liqueur. What do you say, dear aunt, about your own liqueur? Did you really get this drunk because of it? The poor woman didn't know what to say. Here's a more complicated question, Mateo continued. What about my will? Do you have something to tell me about it? What will? Aunt Namesia genuinely didn't understand his question. The one I found on your desk in your office. Were you in my house? Yes, I was, and I found everything. I even attended Gabriel Castro's memorial service and had a lovely chat with his widow. Who is this Gabriel you are talking about? Aunt Namesia lowered her gaze, apparently starting to suspect what the conversation was about. I'm talking about the owner of the apartments in the capital, three restaurants, and a construction company. The one who also has an estate in the village and a beautiful wife as a bonus. Aunt Namesia suddenly burst into laughter, sat down in a chair, buried her face in her hands, and couldn't stop herself from laughing semi-hysterically, mixed with tears. I don't understand what's so funny here, Mateo said, throwing up his hands. Lucretia sat down next to her, trying to comfort her by gently patting her knees. You see, Aunt Namesia finally managed to say through fits of laughter, you really thought that the wool was genuine? Oh, Mateo... You are something else. Wasn't it real then? Well, it was just me asking an old acquaintance, who happens to be a notary, to draft something that resembled the truth. I needed it for my book, you see, but she, as usual, got a bit carried away. She included all the dates and names, which was a bit too close to reality. Mateo was momentarily stunned, processing what he had just heard. But why is my name among the heirs? I couldn't imagine anyone more deserving than you, Mateo. Aunt Namesia, are you serious? Well, as serious as can be. Oh, Mateo, you've always been a dreamer since childhood, and you've remained one. 
Aunt Namesia hugged her nephew. Lucretia joined them, and the three of them were embracing each other until the pot whistled in the kitchen, inviting them to a family coffee party. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.